There's a bit of a paradox in our industry right now. Uh, with all the technological advances over the last seven, eight years, and with the fact that we pride ourselves in being so technologically advanced and on the leading edge, there's one piece of technology that we use almost daily that hasn't changed in probably 40 or 50 years, and that's the uh, Kodak slide projector. Uh, and, and you still have to take that slide and put it in that, that slide projector, which is a little archaic. The annual report is a little bit like the Kodak slide projector. The structure hasn't changed in probably 40 or 50 years. Uh, but it still remains the most powerful document, I guess, that a corporation can put out, which can set up a lot of fear. And fear can drive the process. Unless, unless there's trust. Trust on the part of the designer that the client will be supportive, that the client will listen, that the client will communicate. And trust on the part of the client that the designer will be responsible, will communicate with clarity, and will listen. You do trust me, don't you? I started my practice uh, actually in industry in 1957, uh, opened my own office in uh, 1963, and um, I think I started producing annual reports uh, about 1960. I know that through the 40s and most of the 50s, um, I don't think design was really part of the activity of putting out annual reports. It seemed that uh, they looked more like high school yearbooks with, uh, or scrapbooks just filled with any kind of picture uh, produced uh, by a variety of photographers, uh, no real continuity. Uh, and frankly, uh, if we looked at the several thousands of annual reports that are produced today, uh, many of them still do the same thing. I've judged so many shows and you pick up a book and you know when you judge a show, frankly you're reading it just like the act, the, the real reader. Uh, if, a, if a person generally spends more than 45 seconds, he's, that's it. Uh, and when you judge a show, that's about what you do. You give it even less than that, 10 seconds, 20 seconds. And unless you can tell what that company is about in that short of time, I think the designer hasn't done his job. And I'll tell you, most of the books, you flip through it, and it's so abstract that you don't know if they're in the pharmaceutical business, you don't know if they're in the transportation business, you don't know if they're in the steel business, because everything is so artistically abstract and beautiful and elegant, but it doesn't communicate. I mean, Ricky Werman always says, you know, communication doesn't occur until the receiver understands. It's not just hearing, it's understanding. Uh, Lee Clow, who uh, I think is president of Shiat Day, once said, uh, how small do we have to get before we get good again? And I really believe that philosophy. I think that, um, as I mentioned earlier, designers like to do one thing, and that's design. And uh, once you get big, once you do some 20, 30, 40 annual reports in a year, uh, you're really managing and you're not really designing. So I'm back down to a very small operation and I'm um, having a lot of fun being on the board again and working with computers. I, I like to experiment. I like to try different techniques and um, usually once I've solved some uh, difficult problem, I then go on to another one and never repeat myself. Um, in a sense, uh, that's the same thing you do in, in designing annual reports or, or any kind of uh, graphic work. Um, you're always looking for new ways to express yourself new uh, ideas and innovate. Uh, if you repeat yourself, you're dead. New York and the Meat Show are very connected to me in that I came here in 84, I think, for my first Meat Show. It was a treat. It was really a privilege and exciting to be included, you know, in that group. And it's a very special show. I think it's inspirational for us as designers to see what other people are doing. We get energized in a way from it. I think it sets trends 
I think it's probably been guilty of perpetrating trends, but by and large, it recognizes books that use design as a tool to communicate effectively. We're very influenced in New York by what you see on the street, you know, street fashion, advertisements on the subway. I love stuff like that. I love the signage, the hand-painted signs and the misspelled words that you see. It's just this barrage of stimulus. You never know where your influence is gonna come from. Kent and I, are, as with most good relationships, are opposites. And uh, with a lot of those kinds of relationships, you, uh, you keep pushing each other because you're both interested in different things, but obviously it works when you both come from the same soul. In the world of annual reports, I think we're not doing anything that other people aren't doing in editorial design, in fashion, in video, certainly. What we're doing is pulling a lot of those influences into a corporate world and using those tools and using those, those techniques or whatever, videos really influenced us, computers have really influenced us, how we communicate with a computer, how we use a computer. Communication obviously has a voice and with annual reports, the voice has been a corporate voice, which we might call corporatees. Corporatees is a way of communicating where you're actually trying not to communicate often. And we try to avoid that and try in a lot of the corporate communications that we do to have a voice that's real, that's honest, and that actually tries to say what it's, whatever it is it's trying to say. We are always involved in the writing. There's no way for us to design without being involved in the writing. To us, it's just integral. It's not separate. Because it's all about getting that message across. We believe strongly in type as more than just gray matter. What's interesting about the new technologies is that they are digital. And when you see the same machine actually do sound design, video design, and print design, you begin to see that maybe there's a reason for those different disciplines themselves to merge. The fact that it's all digital has brought our businesses to converge so that we're beginning to offer a uh, transparent platform from print into video and into sound and to design all of that. Coming over here today, I, uh, I uh, was toying with the idea of being associated with a tomato. About seven years ago, uh, Black & Decker uh, came to us and said that they'd like to uh, have us uh, work with them on their annual report. And I guess it's kind of inevitable because much of what I've done in the annual report field has been associated with H.J. Hines. And uh, I'm not sure uh, how long it's going to relationships like this, I feel, are quite important in our business. All the partners kind of have specialties, and uh, mine has been sort of annual reports. And I don't really know why. I mean, they are really can be really torturous things to do. They're complicated, difficult. They require a lot of organization. You've got to be a handholder, a diplomat, a politician, a kind of wet nurse. You've got to be, you've got to listen, you've got to understand things and you have to be strategic. You can't just go off and design anything. You really have to do it right and be careful about it. This report was in the Meat Show in 1979, and I think it has a classic, almost timeless quality to it. It's really a sort of a wonderful product that's the result of a great collaboration between a, a designer, a photographer, and a client. Uh, we sort of have a reputation for being uh, excellent finishes of work and uh, to me that's uh, almost like a, a housekeeping kind of quality. It's not just about putting it on a piece of paper and printing it and getting it out there. You have to make it so that it stands out, that the message is heard, that you get a real, that there's some note of, of passionate meaning to it. And it's not just another workaday piece of of technical literature. I've been doing reports now since 1967 and uh, 
I haven't lost that excitement and that feeling of uh, coming up with a solution uh, and, and uh, seeing it come alive and looking at the client's face and, and getting the feeling that we did solve their problem. And that's really our business, to produce results for them, for the client, solving their problems. People ask me year after year what the, the book next year will be like, assuming that I will get the book back next year, which is always the nightmare of every annual report designer. And the answer is that you don't try to top something, you try to do something entirely different. So what you reach for is to find a level of appropriate risk. You can't, you've got to take a tiny little bit of risk. Now for some people you can take more, for a bank you take very little, but if you don't take some, you're never going to get something which stands above the competition, that stands above its peers. No matter how good your paper is, no matter how good your printer is, if you haven't done your own homework back in your own office, you're not going to be able to print a good product. If I go into my first presentation without something which stretches their minds a little, then I haven't done my job. And if you know, here we are, we're standing on Wall Street. Down here we got George Washington. He, he took the first big risk in America. He was the guy that uh, stuck his neck out. And if he'd lost, he'd have been gone. You know? They would have had him for lunch over in uh, England, where I come from. Good design, quite simple. It's like having good tools, the right tools. There's a whole bunch of other risk takers in here. This is an institution which is about building America, taking risks, and you hope they're appropriate. Some people take more risks. So every day, people walk in this door, and they're going to take risks. And then, when they've taken the risks, they're going to go over here to Trinity Church, and they're going to pray the risk they took actually pays off in some way. 18 press OKs, 2,000 color turnarounds, AAs probably numbering in the millions, a couple of thousand problems, and a long line of great experiences. And the result is number 18, the 1994 Heinz Annual Report. Thanks for the use of the hall, and I think I'm going to go and do a little praying. We started working with the Earth Technology Corporation at a pretty interesting point in its uh, development. The report had always been done in-house, and it was uh, a pretty literal document. It had typically shown workers working in the field, doing the processes that uh, this company performs. When we started working with them, we really looked for some deeper relevance to the company. This is an environmental services firm. Their platform of operations is, is this, nature, everything you see around you. We decided to depict the company in that way, showing basically their form of operations as being air, earth, and water, which are the natural elements. We chose a photographer who is well known as a landscape photographer, uh, actually a student and a protege of Ansel Adams. One of the things that I think was really important for us in using this photography for the Earth Technology Corporation is that it not be gratuitous, it not just be beautiful bugs and bunnies kinds of friendly environmental shots. Uh, I think the discipline of having an idea, having a a conception of where you're going with an image and sticking to that is is probably what makes this successful on a communications level as well as a beautiful piece of art. The information about a company is out there. The information, the numbers, that's all available and that's becoming more available every day. What's not available is the perspective, the point of view. It's up to us as designers to help a company communicate that. Most importantly, I think it's up to us sometimes to help a company define that. A while back, Richard Lewis blasted the Mead Show and uh, design shows in general for trivializing the annual report industry. I think there's an element of truth to that. Uh, maybe they award surface qualities or sort of immediate impact over the deeper communication. The other side of that story is that if four minutes is really how long people spend with an annual report, maybe award shows are a pretty good paradigm for the real world. Sing like you don't need the money. Love like you'll never get hurt. 
dance like there's nobody watching. It's got to come from your heart if you want it to work. <laughs> Technology has affected my work by allowing me to be more efficient in certain areas in the design process. What I think that the digital revolution has done for designers is to put new tools in their hands. Everything has gotten condensed. Clients think you can do it faster, they think you can do it cheaper. Revolution. And because of that, they have a tendency to reduce their schedules dramatically. Technology. But the technology has allowed us to look at um, photographs differently, a combination of doing things that maybe only a photographer or an illustrator could do, whereas we are able to art direct ourselves in creating images. It's just a box, it's not a brain. The box? And you know the brain's still up here, and I think that designers that we have in our office do an, still do an awful lot of sketching before they sit down at the at the box. The box. The concern that we have as a firm is that the box doesn't start di dictating the the style or di uh, or the design. Come on, Richard. The most painful um, transition we made was in typesetting, and we do, as you know, that the production of an annual report um, calls for an awful lot of sophisticated typesetting. The technology itself allows us to look at things quicker, allows us to manipulate things that we weren't able to manipulate before, and allows us to look at type in ways that probably we never would have. The box. As the computers get faster, I guess we could get faster, but uh, the design criteria may lack. If we can make a contribution in some way to making the product better, to extending their thinking, the client's thinking, and incorporating some of our um, uh, some of our thinking into the into the report, then I think that that's very very satisfying. The people know that computers are out there in the design firms. I think Steve actually sleeps with his power book, and um, are requiring that you have the capability to do certain platforms. Uh, that they feel that there is a cost savings and a schedule savings. Uh, so I would say that clients do care about it very much. And in the annual report process, they very, very rarely ask us to, to, um, to pursue the, the digital interface, the seamless interface between the you know, digital information and the printed, printed piece. I don't mind the interactive. I don't mind the change. I don't mind the compromises sometimes. But the, the schedules sometimes are really, really, really trying. I can't believe Steve really said that. Annual reports are about relationships. Between clients and designers. Our work has always been a collaborative effort as well. The working relationship is seamless. Many times Greg will start a project and I'll finish it. Many times Pat will start a project and I'll finish it. Always searching for a new and better way to communicate. Annual reports are complex. They have many moving parts. In our case, two heads are definitely better than one. I think typography is the most important aspect, uh, content of, a, of an annual report, design content. But today, the state of typography is in pretty bad shape. You know, typographers are practically extinct, you know, like, uh, like rare birds. The tendency for a designer is to think that since he's getting paid all the time, that he has to be something new. You know, I, 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 I have nothing, I have no objection to anything new, provided that it's, <laughs> that it's also good, not just new. Our, our business is to, is, to, is to search for good things, not new things. You know, me said, uh, don't try to be original, just try to be good. Originality isn't something you decide you're going to be. That's the product of your brain, you know. If you're original, you're original. You can't say, well, today I'm going to be original. <laughs> it don't work that way. To be simple, to be clear, to communicate, to make himself understood, that, that's, that's what he has to do. And not to be original. The originality is the sum of all of these characteristics. I, I don't think you can design something just right off and, and in its isolated state be of much help to a client. It, I mean, the design is only part of the picture. You know, it's part of, a, of the logistics of, of business. Design is one cog in this wheel. You know, Alba used to call the artists the swindlers. Well, he meant it in the, in the positive way because we, we can make illusions of things that people will think it's, it's something else. 
you know, we're, we're in, a, in a way we're swindlers because we have to make things look better than they actually are. I think it's become apparent to us uh, through doing this that you know so many of our clients talk about uh, strategic relationships and global concerns. And, you know, as designers, we pay lip service to that, but I think what we're doing here is we're, we're crossing the border one way or the other, and we have a strategic relationship, and we're doing exactly what our clients are doing, and we're finding out that it's rewarding. Basically, it's a true collaboration, and we do everything together. The experiment is that we, we think the same way, we have the same thought processes, and uh, we may be designing in the same room or in different countries, uh, but somehow the product comes out virtually the same. Besides that, it's a lot of fun working with people across borders, across countries and in other worlds, for that matter. So I don't see why it wouldn't continue. I'm just tired of carrying John creatively, that's all. <laughs> it's a big load, I gotta <laughs> tell you. It really is. Anyway, it works. Somehow or another it works. We're not sure why it works, but the damn thing works. And we still talk to each other. Yeah. yeah. I think the basis for it is the fact that we uh, have a high level of respect for one another as designers and as people. Most of the time. That's not true. <laughs> Give me some shit, huh? <laughs> Midwest 301 take mark, she says. Anyway, I've done 19 annual reports in my whole career. And as I think about the recognition that those 19 have gotten, I guess I got a pretty good batting average. And you know, it's like I never like to repeat myself. I have this secret thing that on every project, I want to try something new, something different than I've never tried before. Maybe a little thing, maybe a personal thing. Other people may say, oh, that's old hat, but for me it's new and it, it's fresh and it, it helps me get some energy and get excited about the project. I do enjoy the process of annual reports. Well, I need to be honest and say most of the process, sometimes the struggles with the chief financial officer about is it was primarily or primarily was. Uh, things like that get a little exasperating, but for the most part, the process can be a lot of fun. And uh, it's what we do. Try to make them different every year. Size, content, message. Always trying to capture the spirit of Herman Miller. Some years are better than others. But uh, all in all, I think it's a pretty good record. <laughs> you guys, this is hard work. Those of us who do Ann reports, it's really kind of a, a small fraternity. There's probably 25, 30 people in the country who we consider uh, Ann, strictly Ann report designers. And what's unique about the process is it is a mountain of information and oftentimes very technical information, a lot of numbers, etc. Very important, very, very important to the client. There's a thousand details in an end report. There's as many details to the end report as there are numbers in the book. So being able to come in at the beginning, establish a vision, sell the vision, get the client to see the vision is part of the project, but what the annual report is, in our philosophy, is it's the tone of voice to the written work. I gave a speech in San Francisco a couple years ago where I actually compared the annual report process to a B-17 mission. That we all take off together and that the designer has the fantasy of being the pilot, that we all take off with expectations and a certain mission to perform, but somehow things happen on the mission and you get shot up and on the way back you've got wounded on board and you're just trying to get it down onto the runway and get everybody back alive. An Ann report can turn into that same kind of process. I think every designer has spent long sleepless nights or semi-sleepless nights at the printer. We've all spent nights on the couches in the, in the conference rooms. We've all heard the phone go off at uh, 3.30 in the morning and we have to be there at 4. What they don't teach you in school is that you have to pay attention to every detail at four o'clock in the morning, just like you did at four o'clock in the afternoon. When you are out there on press is that you are taken out on press and you get to interact with the pressman. You find out how your sheet's running, what the problems are that he sees. He might see something you don't. There's kind of a rhythm to the process out on press. 
And as you do one okay after another, the printing representative, the designer, the client, the pressman all feel this rhythm together. And as you get close to the end, uh, there's a real sense of accomplishment on everybody's part. A piece of print communication must attract the audience that it needs to attract. But most importantly, I think it needs to surprise, I think it needs to stimulate, and needs to educate. All three of those things are so important to making a successful project. As designers, we really have to ask the very first question. The very first question is, is there a need for this piece of paper to begin with. We're, we're different. I mean, we do sell our work, but we're not selling toothpaste. We are selling something that we have created from our hand. And that is something that you cannot uh, disregard. And that passion really comes from the fact that this is, this is from your soul, regardless what it is. True, we might design annual reports and do two-dimensional design, but as designers, we also design video, we design uh, fabrics, we design sound. We design so many things outside of the traditional definition of what graphic design is. Richard's group was spawning ground for some young talented designers in the late 70s who as they became uh, quite successful in their talents they left the Richard's group and uh, became competitive with one another thus creating a, uh, the real strong Texas design market that became so well known in the 80s. When uh, Chili's approached us about doing their annual report there was strong precedent that had to be set if we were going to be doing their books and that was that we had to capture the flavor and the magic that and there really was a magic to it uh, to their restaurants and it was not being captured in the first annual report that they had done once they went public so that was the precedent they were leaders of their industry and if we were going to do a book for them it had to be leading edge it had to reflect who they were what they were about um, they did not follow, they, they lead, and so everything about the design was going to have to capture that. The most popular annual report that we did for Chili's was the uh, particular book that uh, was an accordion fold format, which was not an unusual format except when you're applying it to annual report design. You could hold it in your hand like a conventional book, but uh, it would also stretch out 14 foot long, and it was like one long stretch of chalkboard with art over it and it was a year in review with financials on the back. They loved that book, absolutely loved when we made the initial presentation, which was quite, quite daring at the time to do something like that. If you're ever in a Chili's restaurant, let me recommend uh, what you need to order. Baby back ribs platter, which is spectacular, and an awesome blossom for an appetizer. And that means you better bring your appetite because it's a lot of food to eat. And top it off with a top shelf margarita if you like. It can be more fun designing for a company that's about fun because there are a lot of unexpected aspects to what you're doing. Um, it has to be very improvisational. There's got to be a degree of flexibility that I don't think people typically uh, relate to the annual report process. They're viewed as a technology company, but they're really an entertainment company, a publishing company that's, that's focused on content. And I think when people start to look at what's available electronically, whether it's digital or just a computer system or anything else, um, it's becoming clear that the tools are terrific, but content is still the main issue. And that's the focus at Nintendo. There's a spirit of uh, people trying to find the right way in a print medium to articulate something that's really kind of uh, a live medium. When I'm working on the annual, it's pretty easy to feel like Mario because there are so many obstacles. There's a chance for a surprise ending. Um, you might be heading to the left and all of a sudden find out you're going to the right. There are plenty of traps. A little something they throw in a lot of the games called warp zones where you just walk in and end up somewhere completely different. There are obstacles in everything. There's always the chance to get burned. You might know where you're going, but you're going to probably end up somewhere else. We did this sort of survey of the, uh, from the people at Progressive, and what they did was vote on those people who they thought were um, the, the biggest contributors in their department. We did a little research and found a photographer who does um, portraits of people in which he includes all of their personal items, and which really tells a much um, richer story of, of who those people are, and I think of who Progressive is because of that. People brought what they felt you know, was important to them it, from, you know, uh, basketball to um, Janet Jackson uh, CDs, a Buddha with movable arms, this little plastic Buddha, and lots of pictures of the family. And, but what, what it did was tell, tell a story of, of these people, not only in the context of, of 
who they are at work, but who they were in their personal life. And I think to the people at Progressive, that really meant a lot. That they really valued them, the, all of them, and not just you know this machine that comes in from nine to five every day. But this this Progressive annual report was was a real break for us because it allowed us to take the way that we typically worked on other projects in the context of the university and bring them to um, the commercial world. Met up with uh, Cracker Barrel in 1981, basically doing um, a black and white book for them their first year and uh, shooting entirely inside the restaurant trying to convey the, the memories and the nostalgia associated with rural southern cooking. And uh, in the food service industry, being quite competitive, they were urging us to put a computer inside the annual report and show that they had uh, management that could handle a large-scale operation. At the time, I think there were 14 or 15 restaurants. And uh, then in 82, we continued to shoot inside the restaurant. In 83, we did it a little bit different. We treated, you know, hand-tinted photography, color photography, and telling the story. And basically, the annual report narrative section was, was pretty much typical, talking about net leveraging of debt ratios and all that kind of stuff, and not a whole lot of interesting reading. So we finally, uh, in 84, I just decided I, I couldn't do the book anymore and um, couldn't shoot inside the restaurant anymore. So we finally, I resigned the project and they said, uh, well, what would you rather do? And so we said, well, we're here in Tennessee and we've got all this country around us. Why can't we use that to tell the story of memories and nostalgia and food and all the things of the past that are associated with it? And, so they finally said, okay, well, show us what you want to do. And so the very first chance we had then of making the book have its own life was in 84. And we used handmade food as the concept. It began a whole series of thematic concept books. Every year since then, we've basically been putting together a, a thematic scrapbook or what have you of, of memories associated with something from the past and how food deals into that story. and. Uh, people associated with it. Picture this. The Harley Davidson logo tattooed to the side of an arm. And then juxtapose that against a retired couple in their 60s or 70s driving their brand new Holiday Rambler RV down the highways. It tells you right away the almost paradox or diversity that's involved in what they call the family of Harley-Davidson. We started working with Harley-Davidson in uh, 1985 when they were on the brink of bankruptcy. And I think a big part of uh, what has really created that success story and turnaround is the one thing they never lost sight of, and that is the brand and its loyalty. Um, in real words, the people. There's a million annual reports that are done around this people theme or a people perspective. Um, I would like to think you can get beyond that. You can get beyond conventional design formulas when you approach a book by injecting some emotion into the uh, realm of annual report design. After you look at a Harley Davidson annual report or a Chicago Board of Trade annual report for that matter, I'd like to think a reader can feel like they've just taken a motorcycle ride or they've just spent an exhausting day in a trading pit. And that's when it gets fun. That's when the ride's at its best. You know, I came out with all the war babies you know, right after the war. There was a trillion guys around looking for jobs. And uh, for whatever reason, uh, by that time I was interested in collateral material. I had been in the business a couple of years, and I heard of this uh, outfit called Litton Industries. So I went there to give him a sales pitch, and uh, a guy by the name of Crosby Kelly, 
who later turns out to be my mentor. He called me in and asked me to do the Litton Annual Report, but he didn't want anybody that said yes to him. He didn't want to be able to tell anybody because he didn't know how to do one either. He would ask me some questions, well, would I do an annual report this way or that way? I said, no, I wouldn't do it that way, and I wouldn't do this. I said, you know, you don't know what you're talking about. I mean, and here I've only been at it two years, right? And you report them. And then, you know, we made history after that. Uh, 59 annual report, uh, which I have here in front of me, is still uh, you know, referred to as the first breakthrough in annual reports was in 59. And this was different than they, anything that ever happened. I found a niche, I found a target area to, to get into. And uh, from then on, uh, it was just how much ingenuity could I bring to the thing? How much uh, creativity could I bring? I would like to say, think that it really communicated for the client, that it made the cash register ring. I talk about my lifestyle being my work, my work is my lifestyle. I think that uh, anybody who would see my house or seen any of the articles and graphics on me would understand the case in that my whole life centers around design, said around collectibles, so that I live the way that I design. Uh, it drives my wife crazy as I have a house full of these uh, collections and stuff. But that is my lifestyle. It's my work and it's my lifestyle at the same time. And even going back to the 59 annual report, I look around here, uh, I realize that I'm still collecting some of the same stuff. Stetson hat, Navajo hat man. Baby, you ain't nothing if you ain't a cowboy. Don't forget it, pard. I came out here about 18 years ago. I think when design was just ripening in this area, there were probably two primary firms in this whole place. One was the Cross organization, and the other one was the Runyon organization. I met this guy uh, actually at the Mead Show, the first Mead Show I had ever judged, a young lad from St. Louis. About a week, two weeks later, I get a call from Rita Sue Siegel. And talking to her, I told her I was thinking of leaving St. Louis. He had just lost a key person. She put us in touch. I remember her exact words. He has a mansion by the sea. A <laughs> mansion by the sea. This was so compelling, I had to come. He invites me out for the day. I get there at four in the afternoon flying in. He, I hear him in his office. When they say, Jim Berte is here, he goes, who? He said, give him a glass of wine, I'll be right with him. <laughs> he came out with a glass of really chilled Chardonnay. I thought, how cool, chilled Chardonnay. I came out about two weeks later, lived in a $17 a day motel for three and a half months till my wife joined me. We then proceeded to stay in that motel for another three months because we couldn't afford anything in Los Angeles. And I used to go home and my wife would be crying, say, it's not too late, we can leave and go back. We didn't, we stayed, and uh, it's been an interesting time. Because I was a really a, a failed product designer when I started out in this business and I segued into graphic design, I didn't have any schooling or preconceived ideas about what you could do or not do, so I sort of invented my own way of doing this stuff. But I was impressed by some of the things and some of the people I saw that impressed me for particular reasons. One of them, I think, was Arnold Sachs, because he was doing stuff that was so uniquely finished. And I realized then how fit and finish was really important to a piece, even if it was just a straightforward book design layout, whatever it was, no matter how classic. But those things impressed me a lot. I learned something from that. I've never wanted to tell people what to do. I've never wanted to tell photographers what to do. I hire them for what they do, and I say, go do that and bring it back to me. Those kinds of attitudes, I think, are important for staying, for staying fresh. You got a 20-year-old little designer? Listen to her or him. They got some good ideas. They're essentially as good a designer as you are. You've got some experience and some world knowledge to bring to the scene. No, sweetie, they won't buy the five-point type because they just won't. Well, it's nice. I know it's nice, but they won't buy it. They, you're, we're building Zen rock gardens, you know? These people aren't there. These people are light years away from us. So if you can keep this kind of attitude going, I think that really helps what you're doing a lot. You have to stay young, and I think what happens to designers is that designers tend to fall into cliches. We all do it. We all have ranges of time that we deal with. I know sometimes it takes me three years to work an idea through. And you see it, and you'll see it keep popping up in things. Where it's going to go in the future, I don't know. It sort of scares me in a way because I see graphic designing almost as a horse and buggy kind of business, and it may be going away. Certainly it's going away as we know it now, 
where it will go, I'm not sure. I don't think anyone really knows. As the technology changes, opinions are going to change. Other things are going to come, come into play. I really don't uh, think of myself as being a photographer. I'm really a designer like everybody else, but I just have this way of thinking through the lens. Um, when you're designing, you know, you're thinking on a rectangular page or a rectangular shape. And when I look through a viewfinder, I see the same things that I'd be seeing as, as a designer on, this, on, the, on the printed page. I look at shape and form and all of those things, but there's something magic that you want to happen uh, that you can't really explain, at least I can anyway, I can't really explain that to a regular photographer. I can say, go and shoot this, and I think it will turn out all right, but I've been in that position myself. I look through the lens, and I see things start to happen. You know, things with depth of field, things that I really, I didn't have a picture of it before as a designer, but when I'm looking through that lens, ideas start to gel, they start to take shape in my mind. What's going to be interesting is, is I've got to put a close-up ring on, on this lens to get this in focus. Mm -hmm. Then to get this stuff down here, that's about three feet, okay? Then I'll use the regular lens, but this will be soft focus. Okay, so, so there'll be a shadow. Since this won't be lighter, there'll be a soft edge shadow. Then to get the, the, the background, uh, you're going to have uh, all of this stuff here in very sharp focus, but around all of it is going to be this weird halo. You know, well, what will it look like? It's an out of focus halo. I've never seen it before, you know, but it, it could be really interesting. We have clients that like us, they pay their bills and so forth. But I think the thing the Mead Show does is it gives us a, a standard, and it's a very high standard. Um, I think it brings all of us together. Um, I have designer friends around the country that I don't think I'd ever have if uh, it hadn't been for the Mead Show. And all the collaboration and, and uh, competition that goes on uh, between all of us. I think the first annual report that I uh, got in the Mead Show was in 1967. That was a long time ago. And to think that here it is almost 30 years later, and I'm still trying to get a damn book in that show, that shows you how much it means to me. We thank the many talented people who have made Mead Generations and the Mead Annual Report Show possible. As this great tradition grows, we look forward to the continued support and interest of our many valued customers and suppliers.